again on behalf of the Nevada chapter of the American Planning Association and the northern section of the state chapter. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome each and every one of you to today's online educational session. Uh, today's online educational session titled State Planning in Nevada uh, features three uh, separate presenters. The first is Scott Carey, AICP, longtime member of the Nevada chapter of the American Planning Association. He is currently a state lands planner uh, with the Nevada Division of State Lands. And joining him today is Ryan Shane, Natural Resource Program Manager with the Nevada Division of Forestry, and Megan Brown, Plant Industry Deputy Administrator administrator, my apologies, uh, with the Nevada Department of Agriculture. Uh, so with those introductions out of the way, uh, again, my thanks to Scott, Ryan, and Megan for being here today, but I will now kick it to Scott. And Scott, whenever you are ready, feel free to begin your presentation. Thanks a lot, Fred, and thank you um, to, the, to the chapter for, for having us. It's, it's uh, being a longtime member of the APA and attending these great webinars we've been having um, it, it, it's awesome to be on this side of it, and it's great to see so many familiar digital faces faces out there. Um, I'm really pleased to be joined by my colleagues here with the state, uh, Megan Brown, Andrea Moe with the Department of, of Agriculture, and Ryan Shane with, with the Division of Forestry. Um, we're hoping to kind of provide you kind of a broad perspective of our individual programs, and, and I think there's a real um, connection with land use planning that I think would be of interest to, to this group. Um, just in terms of format, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak first, then I'm going to turn it over to Ryan, and then um, Megan and is going to be our, 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 big, our big closer out. But um, I'll go ahead and share my screen here. So I just wanted to um, just kind of provide just a, a really very broad overview of our agency, and, and I'd be remiss if I didn't, if I didn't talk about a lot of the great planning work that's being done across the full spectrum of, of the state of Nevada. Um, you know, we have, um, you know, state planning really took off in the 1960s nationally. There was a big effort by the federal government to give money out to states to help um, states better position their, their programs and their agency objectives with, with the state budget. And so as, as kind of planning took off around the state, around the nation with, with, with the, at the state level, um, Nevada kind of got on board and, and the first kind of planning efforts at the state level took part in in the late 60s and they were, within the governor's office there was established a, a planning function that dealt with the state budget. But as the state continued to grow and in the 1970s there was explosive growth, particularly in Las Vegas and in, and in Reno, there was a need to better coordinate planning um, from, from a land use perspective and, and development perspective. Um, our agency was set up in, in 1973. And that was um, at, 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 at kind of the push of, of Governor O'Callaghan. And this is um, from, his, from his speech in the, uh, to the Nevada legislature, State of the State Address in, in 1973. But basically for 50 years, um, our, our agency is, has been focused on trying to work closely across the spectrum of state government, work with stakeholders, local government, federal government, tribal nations across the state to um, to, 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 to get, to get, um, to get things, things coordinated. You know, we have a lot of great planning work that's been done with the Nevada Department of Transportation. They do a lot of, a lot of work that has a direct impact on, on land use planning needs in the state. Um, Sandra Rosenberg and her team, we work very closely with them on, on, on their planning studies, corridor studies, um, long range and, 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 and intermediate stuff. Um, within the, um, Within other departments of state government, you know, there's the governor's of governor's office of economic development. They just recently updated the state's economic development plan, trying to focus on attracting new new industry to Nevada. You know, we have the Nevada Public Utilities Commission. They do a lot of great work in terms of resource planning and trying to uh, meet the meet the energy and utility needs for for across the state. We have the Department of Health and, and Human Services. They do a lot of community-based planning and a lot of um, planning work that are really geared towards public health around the state. And they've been incredibly busy and those plans have really been put to the max with our current pandemic. And there's the Division of Emergency Management. They develop all hazard mitigation plans and response plans and work with, with local governments and businesses and utilities to provide a proper response to, to disasters in our state. Um, we're housed in the in the Department of Conservation and, and Natural Resources, and 
we have a lot of, um, there's a lot of planning work that, that's done within, within our, our department. You know, for instance, we have the Division of Water Resources. They develop plans and regulate the use of water within all of the hydrological um, basins of the state. We have the Division of Environmental Protection in DEP. They do a ton of planning and carry out a lot of regulatory and permitting functions that are geared towards protecting Nevada's air, water, land, and, and, all the, and all the resources of the state. We have the State Historic Preservation Office. They develop plans and carry out management activities and permitting to, that's geared towards protecting cultural and architectural and historic resources across the state. Um, you know, we have the Division of State Parks and, and the newly created Division of um, Outdoor Recreation. They're in the process currently of updating the statewide comprehensive outdoor recreation plan or the SCORP plan. And that's a plan that's really focused on trying to meet the recreation needs um, across the state. I'm likely missing a lot of other departments across the state, but the main point I'm trying to make here is there's a lot of planning that goes on around, this, around the state of Nevada. As I mentioned before, our agency was set up in 1973, and for 50 years we've been, we've been working um, to, to better coordinate land use planning activities around the state. Um, really, the core objectives of, of, of what the agency is supposed to be doing is to um, coordinate with state and local governments, um, work with the federal land managers to analyze their management decisions and, and their proposed withdrawals and protect areas of critical environmental concern. Um, one, of the, one of the big functions that our agency does, we provide technical assistance and we have training programs, we have training resources and other support functions that are available to local governments across the state to help carry out um, state or land use planning and, and zoning things. Perhaps the, the most um, well-known technical assistance that we do provide is um, the publication of the laws related to planning book. That's that it was blue the, blue or yellow. It's been different colors over the years, but it's a listing of all of the state NRS with respect to planning and, and development. I have an exciting announcement at the end of my presentation about that um, coming up, but um, we also work, um, we're housed within the division of, of state land. So we're responsible for um, meeting, trying to meet the long-term land needs for all the agencies and departments across the state with new facilities and, and lands that, that all the different agencies do. We're, we're also tasked with managing a portfolio of all the state-owned lands around the state. Um, the state of Nevada has title to over 300,000 acres of, of, of land around, around Nevada. And we also are, are tasked with um, trying to um, respond and coordinate to local government and federal government land use entitlement and, and land decisions to protect the interests of the state. Um, but basically, you know, it, it's our job to know what's going on, to protect the state and protect the natural resources. And we can't do that without partnerships across the state and, and within the state government as, as well too. Now I'm gonna kind of go into a couple of the specific land use planning authorities that, that are housed within our agencies and some of the agencies and some of the things that we carry out with respect to um, land use planning functions. The first is we have the State Land Use Planning Advisory Council or as many of you might know as, as SLUPAC. This was set up in 1973 and, um, and its intent was really to provide a technical and a statewide perspective on land use planning needs. As many of you are aware, you know, planning in Nevada and development and zoning regulation didn't really come on board until the 1970s at the local government level. And so SLUPAC was set up to kind of be a, um, a way to help support those, those functions around the state. SLUPAC is the only governor appointed state board or commission that we have that has a representative from each of Nevada's counties. We also currently have a member on the council that's a non-voting member from, from the Nevada Association of Counties, NACO. Um, our, our board today is roughly comprised of half elected officials and the other half are kind of technical planners and staff members that deal with natural resource issues. I want to put a shout out for our, our bill um, that we're currently working on that may, if, if it is approved, may change the, uh, the, com the composition of SLUPAC and a big thank you to uh, Marco Velada for all of his great work on, on monitoring the legislation for, for the chapter. But we have a bill, this AB 52 would add um, a member on, on SLUPAC that would be appointed by the governor and that would represent the Nevada Indian Commission. And we also are proposing another member from the Nevada League of Cities to provide um, just more, more perspective and, and, and more reach on, on the council. But basically the main intent of SLUPAC is to review and provide input on land use planning decisions 
and, um, and issues of natural resource importance. I think perhaps the most important thing that SLUPAC does is that it provides a forum for the state, local governments, federal governments, and other management agencies to get together and talk and formally work and discuss these, these sorts of issues. One of the unique powers that um, SLUPAC does have um, deals with the ability of the state of Nevada to designate areas of critical environmental concern, also known as ACECs. These are very similar to what the BLM currently does through its resource management planning process and administrative process where they set up their own ACECs. But basically any, any area in the, in the state can be considered um, for designation as a, as, an, as a state ACEC. And these are areas that would be you know, to protect cultural resources, to protect critical habitat, wildlife, um, from any further um, impacts of development or degradation. And um, it, it, it's an interesting concept. It's, it's been around since the 1970s. And, and when this law was put into place, they were looking at issues you know, around Walker Lake with, with the water, water issues there. They were also interesting enough um, looking to maybe uh, um, use, utilize this, this function to protect development that, that's near Red Rock and the Spring Mountains in, in Clark County. Here we are 50 years later. Um, we haven't, there hasn't been a, a state area of critical environmental concern established yet by, by the state, but it's a power that's still on the books. And we feel it may be a good, a good it could be a good tool that the state could use to help protect areas that, that are worthy of designation. Basically, SLUPAC's role in, in, in establishing state ACECs is that they work with the local governments, they carry out a planning process, they receive the, no, the, um, the nomination, and then they, they hold a public hearing and make ultimately a recommendation to the governor who has the authority to approve or not approve a, a state a, ACEC. One of the interesting things of, of a state ACEC, I mentioned there's a public hearing, there's a newspaper notification, but they also require the consent and, and, are, and are designed to be done in collaboration with, with, with local governments. Another interesting um, power that, that SLUPAC does have within its statute is the resolution of land use inconsistencies. Um, this is obviously a very hypothetical um, photo, and this is a power that, that also has not been um, formally exercised by, by, by the council, but it is on the books, and I think it's an interesting one I wanted to kind of take a little bit of time and, 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 and cover today. But basically, um, when the SLUPAC statute was established, the legislature wanted to create a formal process for local governments who have adjacent, who are, who are adjacent to each other and have land use plans to request um, SLUPAC through its executive council to mediate, provide technical assistance, and if needed, resolve local land use inconsistencies. A very hypothetical example of, of how this power could be could be established um, would be what happened a couple years a couple decades ago in um, northern Douglas County and southern um, Car Carson City, where um, the Douglas County had a had a, a agricultural field that was zoned agriculture, and they were looking to redevelop that site, and they they changed their master plan and, and zoning code, and they 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 changed that and, and built a Walmart and a shopping center on there. At the time, there was a lot of concern because it was right on the border with Carson City that there would be some land use inconsistencies with their master plan, and there would be you know impacts associated from the development, traffic, air quality, drainage, those sorts of things. Under that very hypothetical example, Carson City or Douglas County could have requested um, SLUPAC and its executive council to mediate, provide technical resistance or technical assistance, and if needed, resolve that land use in in inconsistency. Very, very interesting um, power that I think it, you know may may come into play maybe in the future as Nevada keeps going, going, uh, going further out. This this law was put in place before regional planning was was enacted, and so um, it, it was really just kind of a way to help resolve those 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 land use issues between local governments. Um, another land use function that our agency carries out is we are we house the Nevada Tahoe Regional Planning Agency. I'll be honest with everybody, I. I've been um, working in planning for nearly two decades in Nevada, and I didn't really know there was such a thing as the Nevada Tahoe Regional Planning Agency until I started working for the state and they told me to organize a governing board meeting and I was now tasked with managing this agency. But basically, 
this agency comes was was created from the Lake Tahoe by state compact and it, its main function is to regulate gaming space and the and the square footages of of gaming within the Lake Tahoe basin the intent behind this 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 part of the compact was because tourism was having a big impact on the environmental quality of, of the lake and gaming obviously was a big contributor to the tourism industry so what they wanted to do is essentially when the compact was signed, they froze all of the gaming floor area that was in existence at the time in place. And so any alterations to that gaming floor area, they come to the, 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 the NTRPA for review and approval by, by our governing board. Um, wanted to put a quick plug in for our um, state climate strategy. In December, Governor Sisolak announced the, the state's first ever climate strategy. This is really geared towards trying to identify and create solutions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and meet the carbon um, reduction goals that, that, that have been established by, by the legislature. And they're listed on, on the slide here. Um, our agency um, worked, worked on, worked, assisted with, with the development of, of this strategy. But I got, want to give a shout out to our, our state climate policy coordinator, Dr. Kristen Averett with, with um, with UNLV, she really led the effort and developed a strategy, which was kind of a good first step in identifying, trying to create goals to, to do something about, about climate strategy. You know, as this group is well aware, you know, two of the fastest um, warming cities that are projected over the next couple of decades are Las Vegas and Reno. And one of the things to help combat this, and one of the things that got included in this, in this strategy was to help um, increase urban forests. And, and reduce you know the impacts of uh, of the warming in our area you know although there was no in this version of the plan there weren't any specific goals or policies related to land use planning um, or, or development or zoning there was a lot of narrative that was included within this this strategy that that, that considered the, the that we look at the way our state is growing and, and developing and, and to also the need to better conduct and coordinate land use planning efforts across federal state and local um, efforts Another program within our agency that, that we administer is, is the Nevada State Clearinghouse Program. Um, this has been set up by this was set up by Governor Miller in 1989, and it exists basically to inform state the state um, departments of NEPA projects that are going on in the state. We serve as the single point of contact for for all NEPA inquiries um, to the state of Nevada. We have MOUs with federal land agencies. When they send out a NEPA notice, it comes to the clearinghouse, we post it, we send it out to our contacts around the state, we collect those comments and we submit those, those, those back in. Um, we do have a website, this is the address. If you're really interested in what's going on around the state and wanna track projects on a statewide basis, this is a great resource. I'd be the first to admit our current website is very um, limited and it's not very user friendly. There is some good news. We are in the process of updating our website. And I think within the next five or six weeks, we will be um, launching our new website, which will have a lot more functionality and be able to search and track stuff. But if you're interested, we have a sign up sheet, um, an email list. So when we do send out notices, you know, you, you would receive those and we would collect your comments and submit those as part of official record from, from the state. Another um, function that our, that our agency does coordinate as we serve as staff to the Nevada Joint Military Affairs Council or also called as JMAC. Um, a little bit of background on this committee. After the MX missile project in the late in the, in, in the early 1980s where they wanted to build um, over vast areas of, of central Nevada and, um, and it was a big issue. Anyway, um, there was a report that was commissioned by the federal government that came out that said that the, that the military installations, the Department of Energy, were not doing a very good job of talking to each other or talking to the state and local governments around the state on, on, on land issues and natural resource issues. So in the, so in the late, so in the 1990s, um, this, this, um, this, this council committee was set up to, um, to help provide a, a forum to communicate work out and, 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 and work out military issues and issues of, of importance. Um, I kind of teased it a little bit earlier, but we have an exciting announcement for uh, members as an exclusive for all the members of the APA today. We, we're um, excited to announce we're doing a spring clearance sale of um, the laws related to planning book. We did the, the most recent version we, we published last year 
Um, we're doing a sale. It's normally $30. We're doing $10 off and that includes shipping and, and, and delivery. This, as I mentioned before, it's a great resource that, that we work with the LCB to put out, at, um, you know, every other year. And it, it's a listing of each state law and it you know, has, it has tabs on the side that are kind of organized by, by, by function. And, um, if you're interested, please shoot me an email, check out our website. We have a, um, we have a, an, an order form, but we, uh, we have only a few books and we'd love to get rid of them at, out of our office. So, um, that's kind of a, a quick overview of, of, of the state land use planning agency and just kind of some of the efforts at the state level to, to keep a track, to, to keep track of at this time, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Ryan. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. Excellent presentation. I've learned a boatload, particularly about how busy you are. So I'm going to attempt to share my screen. So is that appearing correctly for everybody? Or am I in the wrong? I think you got to do the um, the switcheroo again. Yeah, the switcheroo thing. It is showing up. There he goes. All right. Well, um, it's interesting listening to Scott's presentation because uh, you know you think about all the activities of military and development uh, uh, that's happening across the state and um, the 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 area that. Nevada Division of Forestry is charged with this um, seems frivolous almost. When I talk to geologists, they always say that dang vegetation is just in the way of the rocks. We, we need to know about that. And sometimes it can be that way with development as well. But uh, overall, the vision or the mission of the Division of Forestry is um, to provide professional natural resource and wildland fire management services to our citizens and visitors in the state and to enhance, conserve, and protect forests, rangelands, and watershed values, endangered plants, and other native flora. So that tail end of that statement uh, is really where I'm going to focus today because uh, the nexus with development and um, these uh, pressures that are out there in the world uh, that are most of the time not natural uh, are uh, at odds with the protection of native flora. I will say that um, the, the valuable nexus between the two is that if we can keep our native flora and ecosystems um, in a healthy functioning condition, then the water supplies and clean air and good recreational areas and vistas and things like this uh, that actually complement economies and developments uh, can be sustained over time. So we take our, our role very seriously at, at Nevada Division of Forestry and I'm certainly here for some selfish reasons in, in that the more I can make planners aware and developers aware of um, the role that we serve and, and why we do it, um, that the awareness will create assistance and, and compliance with the state laws and that sort of thing. So just a little bit of background um, on the Nevada Division of Forestry. The state forester fire warden position was created in 1949, so predated um, some of the uh, federal uh, information that um, Scott provided in terms of the state and federal push for state planning. But I will say there was a strong nexus in the late 60s and early 70s, both with the environmental movement uh, across the country, but probably along with this desire to do state planning. And so we saw a large push uh, in our statutory areas um, that include uh, our three main statutes are NRS 472, which is the duties and powers of the state forester, 527, which is the area of protected flora, which I'll talk quite a bit about today, and 528, which is our state or forest practices act. Most states have a forest practices act, regulates everything to do with forestry and the operations therein. So um, one plug I want to make is that on, on our website, uh, forestry.nv.gov, at the bottom, there is a link for our um, latest edition of our forest range and watershed action plan. 
this is a plan that's required uh, under federal law for us to produce that covers our state. And we put it together with, uh, in collaboration with all levels of government and partnership. Uh, and um, there's a draft on there. We've already gone through our review period and we just haven't yanked that down yet. Um, but the final version should be coming out very soon as it's uh, been approved uh, at the Washington DC level. But that's a very good place to find some information about what the current challenges are and threats to our ecosystems, as well as the opportunities for us to join together and manage our uh, lands and ecosystems across jurisdictional boundaries. So with that, thank you very much for having me at your uh, brown bag today. And um, let me see if I can figure out, there we go. Next slide. So I'm going to jump right into this NRS 527 and talk about the protected flora situation we're charged with uh, enforcing here in Nevada as an agency. But I will tell you, we don't have enough staff members to do this uh, by ourselves. So we, we actually rely on uh, planners and people at the local level to help provide some level of filter and Scott's been a great addition at the state. I mean, he picks up things all the time and feeds them to us. So thank you very much for that, Scott. Um, one of the first things we get into is timber trespass. That's pretty easy. Don't cut other people's trees without their permission, right? So we don't really get into that too often. Uh, usually it's by accident. People don't realize where their property boundaries are, that sort of thing, and accidentally drift. And so we don't get into that quite a bit and it's a really easy one to understand. Um, the next one that we get into is really defining what constitutes take. So without permission, of course, or without the proper permits in place, if anybody cuts, destroys, mutilates, picks, or removes any part of a tree, including or, or uh, other types, fern, wildlife, you see they're all covered here without permission. It pretty much follows along with the one above don't do that without somebody else's permission. And within that, that particular line of the statute it is all, also offering us the first reference of uh, critically endangered plants, which is one of the bigger issues that we're starting to see now um, crop up. And it is one of the most heavily regulated areas uh, within our statute. So, um, one point I want to make is that these laws cover all lands um, and not just state lands, not just private lands. The only lands that are accepted out of our statutes under guidance from the uh, Attorney General's office is, the, is tribal lands at this point. And that was a more recent set of guidance uh, that I received. Um, otherwise, and even in the past, we had uh, regulated activities on those lands. So we do provide consultation to them and everybody else as, as we work through these challenges, um, but we don't enforce or regulate on tribal lands. So the next piece is uh, really targeting Christmas trees, cacti, and yucca. And those, those uh, particular types of plants, the reason why they're listed specifically is because they were targeted um, for uh, commercial purposes in, in many cases. Christmas trees is obvious. And that's any evergreen tree that's native to the landscape and even a branch of that tree. Um, and the cacti and yucca, uh, people don't know there's kind of a, like an underground black market. People go out there with pots and just start digging these things up across the landscape, tons of them at a time, haul them into a city like Las Vegas and sell them to people for the landscaping. And so we're seeing a definite impact to our native landscapes and habitats uh, for wildlife, et cetera, from that. So um, the, the law isn't, you know, there's some leeway there for an individual or uh, whomever to do, um, as long as they have permission to harvest off any piece of land, whether it's federal or private or local, um, these plants, but no more than uh, six per day and uh, over some consecutive days, like seven consecutive days. So. Um, if you're just a hobby collector or something of this nature, you're not really selling the plants and you're only collecting a few of them and you have permission to, then you're fine. Otherwise, you need to apply for tags and shipping permits and these kinds of things. 
um, there are some exemptions there um, in terms of utilities and these kind of things. Even on highway projects, we've uh, worked with them and, and gotten the NDOT to salvage and even private developments and that sort of thing to salvage. So that means they'll actually pot them up, hold them, and then replant them in areas where uh, they can survive and exist in a healthy condition. So then we move here into uh, the fully protected species. These are the critically endangered ones. And there's a process to get these things listed. Right now there's 24 species on the list. Um, and the for state forester is supposed to, you know, regard these things as in distress and going to be threatened with ex extinction. And I, I owe a plug to the Nevada Division of Natural Heritage, which is also in the uh, Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. And we heavily rely, by statute even, on them for scientific input. And so it's not one off. The agencies, you know, got the stick and the carrot and, and the book. Uh, we rely on our partners to help us make an informed decision in this regard. Um, once they're listed, they pop onto that NAC 527 list, which I have listed there. Um, and once they're there, then any kind of impact to them has to be permitted through us. Um, this is what one of our biggest challenge areas because people are simply unaware. A lot of these things are little tiny wildflower looking things or what we call half shrubs, which is a wildflower with like a woody root basically or woody stem. And, um, you know, they're, they're tied to specific soil chemistry and climatic conditions and these kind of things. And so they can't readily be moved around the landscape and they just kind of hug onto these real small areas. Um, that's partially what makes them susceptible to extinction is their footprint is usually not very big. Um, and therefore, any little stochastic event, uh, particularly like a bulldozer, can <laughs> wipe them out fairly easily. Um, so on this next slide is our list of species. And again, you can always go to the NEC and look that up. And on the right is a map showing the location um, of these various species. Our intent is to provide, hopefully in the near future, a um, mapping tool to share with the local jurisdictions and planners to help inform um, permitting processes, uh, awareness, et cetera, um, so that people um, hopefully can become one aware that they might have this species, a particular species that's protected on their, on their property that they need a permit and they need to consult. Uh, Nevada Division of Forestry before they take any actions. Recently, because of the development pressures and the uh, expedited uh, permitting processes and, and growth and et cetera, uh, property values are way up. You know, people, this, this uh, develop mach uh, development machine we have going in Nevada is just chugging along at uh, kind of a red line pace. Um, not all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed all the time. And so we're responding to unpermitted uh, damages uh, in, in some cases at this point. And we, we really wanna stay out of that. It's, it's less costly for everybody um, and uh, rewriting plans after they're completed for applications and permits uh, is twice the amount of work that it would normally take in cost and everything. Plus we have a cost to rehab the site if uh, things are damaged. So um, I'm going to move to the Forest Practices Act and Chapter 528 and kind of discuss that a little bit more because this one's zeroed in more on um, um, timber species, logging, these kind of activities that happen in forest lands. Um, again, a place where um, a high degree of economic value existed, particularly in the past. Uh, I mean, lots of history in the Comstock in terms of harvesting trees on the Sierra Mountain, Sierra Nevada Mountains, and you know, using them to support the mining activities uh, in Virginia City and during the mining, doing that sort of thing. And so, you know, a lot of people don't realize it, but up in the Tahoe Basin, that land had been trashed so bad that uh, in terms of high grading timber that, um, the land could hardly be sold. 
And so uh, I forget the individual's name who bought a bunch of it. Uh, the mansion is there on the edge of the lake, bought it for pennies on the dollar um, because it was so trash that nobody wanted it. Um, so the idea is that we, we put these protections in place so that uh, logging practices don't endanger water quality, wildlife habitat, um, these sorts of things so that we can keep uh, everybody in drinking water and, and the wildlife can survive and that sort of thing. So um, on the definitions here, uh, recently they were um, updated in our, in our last legislative cycle and uh, a logging operation used to be just cutting trees um, and, in, and they changed it to mean that you actually have to load the logs on a truck now and take them to a mill um, and, and find that commercial value. And, um, the reason why that was changed uh, locally, the fire protection districts lobbied to make that change because they were doing a lot of cutting but in the name of wildland fire uh, management and protection of local communities. So they didn't want to necessarily have to go through a logging planning process uh, with us to reduce fire fuel risks uh, around these communities. Um, and so that's really what a logging operation means now. And then timber owner is another one that gives us a sideboard in terms of our regulation. And in this case, not only do you obviously own a piece of forest, but that parcel can't be zoned for say residential or commercial or something of this nature. It has to be zoned as, um, I, and I'm not a planner, so um, maybe there's something like open space or some other rural designation that doesn't say it's for some other use that's beside for growing those trees, et cetera. And if, if in the Q and A, you guys have feedback on what those designations are, uh, I would be very interested to hear uh, what they are. So um, in the event you're actually going to, you know, do uh, some sort of development or have a plan for a piece of land and cut trees and put them on a truck and, and take them to a mill, then there's this logging permit um, that needs to be applied for. And then a performance bond posted and erosion control, fire control, stocking requirements, all these things are then issued as part of the permit um, so that these practices, and when I say stocking requirements, that's like when you get done with the logging thing, um, what, how many trees are gonna be left on the land at what spacing, et cetera, um, to ensure that the environmental quality following this activity is such that it protects water quality and wildlife habitat and uh, soil stability, these kind of things. So in the event you want to convert the land from something that's, uh, say, a timber owner type of situation where, hey, I've got this big parcel of land, I've always grown trees on it, I might use it for other things, but it's zoned to grow trees and, and we obviously log it maybe once in a while and make some medical revenue that way. But if I want to convert it into a golf course or a community or some other land use, then we do have this official timberland conversion certificate um, process that's enabled by the statute. And again, it runs a similar way as a logging process. You would apply post performance bond and uh, your, your certificate would be issued with a host of um, requirements and restrictions so that um, there was no threat from the denuding of the land ultimately, or, or, or at least high, high alteration of the land going from a zone of just open land to something that was a developed nature. And if in fact, you know, these performance bonds are, if somebody went in there and made a mess, cut all the trees down and walked away or carved up some land and walked away, that we would have the ability to financially go in and rehabilitate the site and make sure that it didn't present a risk to downstream water users or neighboring properties or uh, what have you. So um, we, who I have listed here is uh, our resource management officers. These are our operational leads in, in these areas that I presented today out in each one of our three regions in the Nevada Division of Forestry. They can always be contacted. Actually, we had a recent staff change, um, but uh, in the northern region, 
So that one is uh, actually poorly different these days, same contact information. So um, you could always get a hold of her there. Um, but I guess, um, you know, the more that everybody can become aware of these things and transfer this information amongst each other, uh, make sure that they're aware that these permits exist, the value of keeping, you know, our native uh, plants protected and, and interfacing with the Nevada Division of Forestry, the better that we all can play in this game because we're sharing the sandbox. And so just highly uh, encourage you all to um, hopefully you learn something and, and uh, don't be afraid to contact us and ask us to present other places or share information or consult on your projects or plans um, as they exist. And thanks uh, for having me again today. Um, and I guess I'm ready to turn it over to Megan. Thanks, Ryan. Appreciate it. Um, again, my name is Megan Brown, and I'm with the Department of Agriculture. Um, we also have Andrea Moe on the um, call as well. She is one of our Noxious Weed staff members, and if any of you guys have hard quizzes at the end, um, she'll be able to, to give some technical sort of stuff, um, but I also wanted to make sure that she gets introduced. She's an invaluable member of our team. Um, and is the one answering the Noxious Weed email and phone line. So if you guys do have further questions, she'll be your point of contact. So I want to make sure that you had a face and a name um, for that wonderful resource. So thanks, Andrea, for being here. And, and hopefully they won't be too hard on us with questions coming up in the end. Um, so thank you for being here. I am going to start my presentation. Hopefully everybody can see my screen. Um, appreciate the opportunity, both Scott and Fred, for us being here today. It's been, um, I've learned a lot, which is great. Um, we have so many valuable resources within the state agencies and departments. Um, and I think not only hopefully will the members of the audience receive some good information today, I think I've learned some ways that maybe we can coordinate and be better resources for each other too. So really appreciate the opportunity and thanks for letting us join today. Let me see if I can figure out how to change the slides because it's all right. So I'm going to start out with a little bit of um, background on um, the laws and regulations related to noxious weed designation and then get into some specifics as how it relates or can relate, um, hopefully, to planning and planning processes within all levels of government. Um, so noxious weeds are designated in NRS 555 and it's any species or plant, um, specifically we work with um, plant species within the Department of Agriculture, um, Department of Wildlife and other agencies um, deal with aquatics and others. Um, so this is a plant which is likely to be detrimental or destructive or difficult to control and eradicate. So sort of the opposite of what Ryan was just talking about. Um, NRS 555-130 declares the noxious weeds. Um, they must be um, something that's not already introduced or established or is within minimal extent um, and control within the state. Hey, Megan, um, we're not seeing your your slides. You're not seeing my slides. Yeah, maybe you can go to slideshow. Okay. Megan, this is Fred. We're, we're seeing your slide deck, not your presentation. You might have to okay. change your, your screen. Is that better? Nope. <laughs> okay. Let's. Can you see anything at the moment? Uh, we're just seeing your slide deck, just the open PowerPoint file okay. itself. There you go. All right. Do I need to change the display setting, or can you see? I um, think in the bottom right hand corner, if you hit that slideshow button, you were hovering around. That one? That one, yeah. That didn't do anything? You, you might have to go into the share screen function um, in, in Zoom and actually select the presentation, not the, not the slide deck file. Hey, there we go. Excellent. Is that better? 
that. Uh, oh, you had it. Uh, you might want to go into display settings now and, and just swap out. Yep, there you go. Ah, perfect. Okay. Nice. Thank you. All right. <laughs> it's, I have three screens up, and so that's my problem. I apologize. Um, so to go back, so I think I'm, I was at the, the different categories of species, and we um, go through a, a process every so often to update our species, not only from um, either new found species that we've had or threats that are coming from um, surrounding areas, and then we also list them based on um, categories. So categories, um, are okay uh, there's three categories a b and c i'm sorry things are changing in all three of my screens and i'm a little disoriented so i apologize so category a's are generally not found or limited within the distribution of of our state category b's weeds are weeds that are generally established but you know we maybe only have random pockets in a particular county or several counties um, and then category c's are, are widely distributed um, and found in many areas of the state. Um, we um, are working currently on an early detection and rapid response plan, um, which at some point I'd like to come back and talk to this group specifically about, about how we can get engagement with those um, early detection rapid response, um, more specifically to the rapid response part of weed treatment. Um, but these species are our category A and a couple of our category B species of things that we'd like to, um, as soon as they are found in, in the state, um, take some, some action on. So um, our approach for working on noxious weeds is, and more uh, relevant to you guys here today, is our weed control district, districts. Through NRS 555.202, um, we can work uh, is how we districts are established and I'll kind of get into those details, um, but we'd like to work with our weed control districts. We have several in the state. They're um, not fully organized in every county. We also work with our conservation districts, um, which are also housed in DCNR um, and a wonderful group of organization and locally elected officials that work on conservation projects within the districts. Um, we also like to engage with our county commissioners and local planning authorities. We like to be a resource, whether that's us presenting at county commission meetings or working with their local road and planning departments to ensure that they understand what weeds are currently present, um, how they can map those, um, and uh, be engaged in that process. Also, through our um, program, we have the ability to do enforcement and application of regulations under um, NAC 555. We try not to, to um, wield the stick too much, um, but it's also really important for resource health um, to have weed-free areas. And so if needed, um, we will use that enforcement. And then obviously supporting our partners and in incorporating noxious weed criteria and planning within their local planning requirements. Um, that's something that I hope um, is conveyed today. And, and I hope that Andrea and I can be a resource to you and your local and regional planning authorities and, and how maybe weed control can be part of, of those planning requirements. So just to go a little bit more into weed control districts, any board of county commissioners in any county in accordance with um, chapter 308 of NRS can create one or more weed control districts. Um, some weed control districts, can, excuse me, encompass an entire county. Obviously we know our counties in the state of Nevada are also quite large. And so some tend to have we control districts for particular areas. Um, the regulations that are established for those we control districts can help treat, survey, coordinate and educate their local partners and meet their, their local needs, which is really important. What is affecting um, or transmitting weeds in one part of the state may not be the same as another. And so it's really important for that local engagement. Um, and like I said, weed control districts can be any incorporated area or of the county or the entire county. So weed control districts can also be part of the enforcement process. We have some weed control districts um, that do weed control work within their designated boundaries. 
Um, they can work um, either voluntarily with a landowner or through an enforcement action. Um, they can also create liens on properties where non-compliance is occurring. Um, we also work with our county commissions that are, um, a, that are curious or interested um, regarding the non-compliance enforcement. Sometimes we work through the county commission, sometimes we work through the weed control district, and then some we have cooperative weed management areas and they're the ones that coordinate with private landowners related to noxious weed non-compliance. Um, and then if need be, um, the county commission can work through and issue a lien on the property. We have civil penalties that are also um, afforded to us and you can see those here. Some of our challenges and priorities, um, infestations on land development, also similar, um, but for the opposite reason that Ryan talked about is that um, the propagated material, so either the roots or seeds that are found in soil can be moved through development. So there may be an infestation in one part of a development and not another, but for whatever reason, the equipment um, is obviously moved or the soil is moved and then that propagated material will now be found in a new location, again, spreading the, those infestations and those weeds into new areas. Um, we are working through early detection and rapid response for our class A and a few of our class B species, as I mentioned. And if, if I haven't totally bored you about noxious weeds, I'd love to come back and talk about those specifically and, and how we can become engaged. It's a really, um, it's economical. Those infestations tend to be small um, and, uh, economically effective to, to work through. And then it can also, if we don't spread them, um, we don't have to worry about cross jurisdictional boundary issues, which tend to happen with a lot of our, our weeds and our checkerboard areas across the state. Um, treatments and liens, like I said, through county commission and coordination work. Um, we work on infestations on both public and private lands. Um, and we would like to, um, stem that and work on having increasing um, communication related to planning activities and whether that's federal land management activities from a planning of doing fuel breaks to if a community is, is um, doing development out on a new landscape and what that might like, look like and what weeds pre uh, presence might be there. And then helping learn and understand vector and transmission corridors, whether that's um, boot uh, cleaning stations at trailheads, brushing your bike or brushing your dog, not your bike, brushing your dog after uh, a walk or cleaning your bike tires, those sorts of things, but really understanding those um, and making sure that, that all our partners are, are working to educate. Um, we really rely, um, we have a small noxious weed staff, and so we really rely on collaborative efforts. And so um, Part of the reason I'm here today is to find more partners in ways that we can help educate um, and ensure that noxious weed mapping survey and treatment is done throughout the state of Nevada. County commission and planning departments um, can play a key role by creating um, specific requirements related to noxious weed ID survey work um, and then what would if survey or if the survey work um, comes back and it's positive how we're dealing with that propagated material and cleaning and that sort of stuff is can all be incorporated into local planning um, and jurisdiction requirements. Um, we also would like to um, work with you guys to promote our weed free forage and gravel pit. Um, so if material needs to be brought in for a certain project, you can um, work through gravel pits that have been certified as noxious weed free. Um, those have special permits that we provide um, and certifications and then you will be guaranteed to get material that is doesn't have propagated material. You can also use weed free forage for erosion control and, and um, that sort of stuff. So we um, can provide li lists of resources for that. Um, and it's definitely something that a lot of the agency, public land agencies are requiring for work. We'd also like to see an increase in those weed control districts across the state. They're invaluable in communication and education and, and if needed enforcement for noxious weed work. And frankly, to grow 
a network that can ID, treat, and educate about noxious weeds and what they mean for wildfire threat and ecosystem health. We also are working on our non-compliance. We've had a history of being strong on the education standpoint and we're not walking away from that. That's still critical and, and very important, but um, at, there's only so much education can do. And at some point, um, you know, enforcement needs to happen and ensuring that these, especially for our class A weed species that treatments are being done. Um, and so we have been working, like I said, to communicate to our planning partners and county commissions about the authority through, that we have through 555 um, and getting those um, infestations taken care of, especially those that are in our vector areas along um, highways, trails, transmission lines, those sorts of things. Um, we are working on having an annual strategic plan based on the mapping data that we get, and we'd be happy to help counties and local planning jurisdictions um, share with them the weed data that we have, and if they can need help with prioritization of those, of those projects. Um, and make sure that we're having complete projects. The things about weeds is it's not usually a one and done type of thing. There needs to be constant um, survey and treatment work. And so it's really important that we find small infestations and work to control those um, while we can. And like I said, we're also working on a step-by-step -step process um, and funding related to early detection and rapid response, ensuring that we're um, deploying resources as quickly as possible for those class A species. And I think I went through that really fast because I was really nervous because <laughs> it was I was having technical difficulties. But again, um, I really appreciate being here. I um, here's my contact information and then the the noxious weed team information, um, and be happy to answer any questions. And really, again, appreciate. Hey Megan, this is Dean Patterson with Churchill County. I had a question. Yes. Let me see if I can, have I stopped sharing my screen yet? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Oh no, that's your screen. <laughs> there we go. All right, there we go. Uh, so my question has to do with dairies. Uh, Churchill County has a lot of dairies and I'm kind of curious mm -hmm. what kind of planning activities you could talk about related to dairies. Um, and I suppose maybe even feedlots, which may be more applicable to other jurisdictions. Great question. I don't have a ton of um, resources that I have at my fingertips at the moment to answer that question, but Dean, I will um, write down your name and contact information and make sure, but I know that we do have some resources available related to that. And so we'll make sure that somebody with the correct answers get back to you. Thank you. Yep. Uh, we, we do have time. We have about uh, 25, 30 minutes uh, for Q&A. So if you do have questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat uh, function in Zoom. Or if you just want to ask your question aloud, as Dean just did, uh, please feel free to go ahead. Fred, I had a, I had a question for Ryan. I was kind of curious, Ryan, about, um, you were talking about the state cert issued um, Timberland con con conversion certificate. I was just kind of curious when the last time the state issued that sort of a, uh, sort of a, a, a certificate and what that process is generally looks like. Um, I'm trying to think, it was definitely in the, in the probably 2014 timeframe or, post 2010 for sure. I think um, we didn't have a good track record as an agency of ensuring that this happened. Again, we really need the help of our local planning agencies to help funnel people towards us to make sure this happens. In some cases, like in Douglas County, I know that the plat maps actually say you need to go talk to NDF about this land before you develop it. Um, so there was a note there and, and unfortunately that's not a consistent situation across our local planning environments. Um, but it's most helpful when that can happen. And I would love to see that for our uh, particularly critically endangered species as well. But for older subdivisions that, you know, we had no, we have no choice but to just say they're grandfathered in basically. Um, 
for the ones that we've issued more recently, basically what happens is a developer buys a piece of property and it's just native forest on it. And they would approach us with a plan. And I believe on every one of our situations that requires an application, that application, con the contents of that application are listed very specifically in the corresponding administrative code to the NRS that gives us the uh, authority to issue the permit um, or the certificate in this case. And so uh, we would guide these individuals. They are like, they would realize, oh, we, we need a timberland conversion certificate. Can you help us out? Yes, the first step is you go and create an application that follows the contents in the NAC and submit that to us. And then there's a back and forth and every one of our permitting processes is the same this way. There's a back and forth. We, we review their plans and their application and determine if there's any points at which we need to suggest a, a mitigate, mitigatory type of edit or change to avoid a likely scenario of a, a negative impact that we don't want to create um, by following through with the proposed development. And so we kind of go back and forth because what we propose might be, uh, you know, inhibitive of certain activities or the finances uh, uh, that they need to make on the property, et cetera. So it's kind of back and forth dance we do. And uh, eventually we land on a, a place where we agree that yes, they're protecting the natural resources um, yet they can still develop the land is uh, the, the land is a uh, need to, to to make money and conduct uh, economic activity and so um, once that happens then you know we do a bond calculation and uh, we we receive this bond and then issue this certificate and once the certificate's issued uh, we will monitor that development, make sure the conditions of the certificate are met all the way through the project. And uh, once that uh, project is complete, we basically sign off on the certificate, release the bond, and everybody walks away, and that's kind of the end of the deal. Does that answer your question? It does. Thanks. Thanks, Ryan. Yep, no problem. Any other questions from any of our attendees? Again, you may be muted, uh, so you may have to take yourself off of mute to ask your question, uh, or of course you can type in your question into the chat function. Um, one question is maybe others are thinking about a question to ask I might have or do have uh, for, for any of you, each of you. Um, uh, several of you mentioned uh, conservation districts uh, and conservation districts in the state of Nevada and their role in, you know, land use management, you know, noxious weed management. Um, perhaps one of you or a few of you could just give a quick overview of what conservation districts are uh, and what their general role in Nevada is to, to some of us that may not be as familiar with conservation districts. Go ahead, Scott. No, I was gonna I was gonna turn that one over to you. <laughs> um, so conservation districts, and if if I misspeak, Ryan, I know that that you're also very familiar as well. Um, but conservation districts are locally led and locally elected uh, groups. They have um, usually more watershed designation sizes, but some have have come together. Um, they're distributed throughout the state. Um, they work on and set conservation priorities um, for their areas and work on conservation projects. Can relate to anything from water quality, soil health, noxious weed, uh, obviously is the one that I work with them most on. Um, and um, some of them come together and buy equipment that then is shared between um, members, um, whether that equipment is used for um, restoration efforts for fire, fire suppression, or agricultural um, activities as well. Um, the conservation district um, from a state perspective has a, a state director, which that position is currently vacant, um, but Melanie Ayton is, is in it. And then there's three regional staff uh, members from DCNR that help run those programs. And so 
I'm happy to share the link or Scott, we can, I can put it in the chat here um, as well, but um, a regional mem uh, state employees that kind of help organize and facilitate those groups. And so one's in Winnemucca, one's in Ely, and one is in Elko. Uh, if I could add to a little bit, Megan did a great job. Um, what happens is each one of these districts has a locally operated board of directors and most of the time they are people who own property within that district. Um, in many cases, you know, in the conservation district, the personality of it is really reflective of, of the general uh, location of that district. So you go up to Tahoe and that district has a lot of money, has a lot of staff, they're pulling in grants all the time and it's an amazingly productive and busy conservation district. And then there's some that are, you know, maybe even inactive in some parts of the middle of Nevada where landowners are, they don't have a lot of time to contribute to uh, something that operates a lot like a nonprofit. So they don't get a lot of money from the state uh, to operate or anything like that. Um, and so they're pretty reliant on other kinds of revenue to, um, I guess, perform the things that they want to perform. And uh, lo more recently, they're trying to speed up, uh, and Megan, maybe you can say the actual name of the process that they're using, but essentially an assessment of natural resources within the conservation district to determine their priorities where they need to invest money and energy and time uh, to make the difference on the most important issues within the district. Um, not all of these districts have that and, and very few actually have this assessment and plan in place that orients them and, and helps them achieve and, and I think find success, which can be rewarding to the, to the members and those who contribute. Can you remember the name of that document or that process? I can't remember. Not now that you asked me, it's resource assessment something. Resource um, needs assessment, I believe. Yes, resource needs assessment, yes. And um, so you have some very active people, like in mostly actually in Eastern Nevada, Lincoln County, Elko County, and, and I don't know if White Pine is included, but there's a few counties uh, where the conservation district pretty much encompasses the whole county. And uh, they've, they've been digging in on this front um, and trying to get these RNAs uh, completed. And then that gives them kind of equal footing with uh, federal land management agencies and other uh, people, and even maybe even a leadership position so that people can join in and do cross boundary collaboration and that sort of thing. I'll tell you that um, we love conservation districts. They make our jobs so much easier and we get to support the people and the things they wanna do for their land. And that's a much better position than us riding in on a horse, you know, air quotes, uh, from nowhere basically and saying, we're the state, we're here to help. Um, and, and that doesn't always feel good for that level of government to come in and, and say what we wanna do on their landscapes. So we just very much appreciate these conservation districts and especially the people that are helping run them. And, uh, you know, for, for those of you, uh, you know, attending, uh, Scott has just uh, in the chat function uh, dropped uh, some great information on the state conservation program and some contact information. Um, you know, there's also the Nevada Association of Conservation Districts, which is kind of their professional group, um, you know, provide training uh, and, and education, both for conservation district board members and members of the public. Um, that was a kind of a self-serving question. I've worked with conservation districts over a number of years now. Um, and, you know, for, for those of you, again, not necessarily familiar with conservation districts, uh, under the authorizing statutes in state law, conservation districts actually have quite a bit of at least on paper power uh, to really influence land use planning decisions and natural resource management decisions that are made at a local county or municipal level. 
Um, in other states, uh, sometimes the election for conservation district board member is more hotly contested in prize than county commissioner or city council member. Uh, Nevada is actually kind of one of the odd duck states in that the conservation districts don't wield as much power as in other states. Um, they are they they do at least again have quite a bit of you know influence, um, but for our uses from a planning perspective, the conservation district itself is a pipeline to property owners over a wide geographic area. Um, and I would certainly encourage everyone here, uh, if you want to learn more about the conservation district program, look at the contact information that Scott's provided in the chat function. And I, I guess I'll just add one more point to that but i think they're also the people for the conservation districts that are functioning they're also very engaged members of the community and so if you have questions or concerns related to whatever your perspective of planning is there there's a list of names that are engaged people within that within that area and i really encourage them i mean they tend to be very untapped especially in this particular arena from um so I would just encourage you there, if you're having a hard time finding people to be engaged, those are, those are a great group of people. Absolutely. Um, any other questions from any of the attendees, Scott? Doesn't look like we have any in, in the chat, but I, I kind of want to expand on, 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 on that point a little bit when the conservation districts and the local um, land use functions that, that they can comprise. And I, I think Ryan hit it, hit it right on the nail you know, I think overall looking through our statutes that we have in NRS 278 and planning and zoning and development, the state really lets those decisions be at the local government level. You know, Nevada does not have home rule like other states do or and, and only local control is only given for specific purposes by, by the legislature. I don't know if that's gonna change, but one of the unique powers that cities, counties have is, is to regulate development and carry out its own land use planning activities. And I just kind of want to expand upon my, my presentation a little bit more. That was always the intent was that the state would support those local government um, efforts. Obviously the legislature is going on right now. I, I, um, there's a lot of discussion about planning and housing is a huge issue right now, but I don't see, you know, there's 35 days left in the session, but I don't see the state you know, wanting to take back that, that control. And, and, and I think it's worked well that the, that the local governments are able to carry out their own land use planning, planning functions. And we at the state here are to collaborate and partner and try to, you know, facilitate development that, that, is, that conserves natural resources, carries out the functions that, that are needed and is done in an, in an orderly fashion. I brought up the, um, you know, the, the, the land, the, um, resolution of land use inconsistencies power that SLUPAC does have. Going back and looking into the research um, and the legislative intent, um, it was it was always it was kind of put in there to be a resolution and a technical support kind of kind of a function. It was not that the state would come in and override local land use decisions. It could if that was part of the resolution that was ultimately done, but that really came out of um, the late great Senator Joe Neal from North Las Vegas, they were really concerned at the time along the Buffalo Ditch and, and within his district that there was land use decisions that were made um, in the city of, of Las Vegas and in Clark County that were causing drainage issues and other land use impacts. And the state legislature at the time really wanted a way for local governments to work out those issues. Obviously with regional planning and, and, and other settlements that we have around the state, there's, there's a good forum to do that. But you know, at the state level, we're here to support local land use planning and to collaborate. And the best way that we can do that is to partner with agencies like, and, and organizations like this and develop partnerships. We're a small but lean state government, but I think we're here, we're here to support and, and collaborate and not, not take over. Well, I, I know everybody is busy these days, and I, I don't want to take any more time than we absolutely need. I, I don't see any additional questions or anybody raising their hand. 
Um, so just uh, very quickly, of course, uh, on behalf of the chapter in the northern section, uh, I'd like to extend my thanks to Scott, to Ryan, to Megan, and to Andrea for joining us today uh, to talk about state planning in Nevada and some of the various issues um, that we face and some of the mechanisms um, and administrative support uh, vehicles and tools that exist in the toolbox uh, for planners and really cities and counties and communities throughout the state. Um, uh, there will certainly be additional announcements about other upcoming Nevada APA Northern Section activities and events. Uh, for Northern Section members, we have a couple social events scheduled for later in May, June, and July. Uh, and of course, as just a general FYI to everybody, uh, we are just about ready to announce some details regarding the 2021 Annual Conference of the Nevada Chapter of the American Planning Association. Uh, that will be in October um, of this year. Again, more details to come very shortly. Uh, and certainly uh, to Megan's point specifically, but also to Ryan um, and Andrea and Scott, uh, we the chapter uh, and everyone here very much interested in continuing to work with you. We would love to have each of you back separately, um, you know, at future events, maybe even a presentation at our state conference coming up in October. Uh, we have a, 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 a membership and a group of individuals who are very collaborative in their approach. Uh, and I'm sure that there's a very favorable audience uh, in working with uh, each of you here today. Uh, I will take it upon myself to make sure I get the presentation materials from each of our presenters and sent uh, to all of our attendees with contact information, again, for Scott, Ryan, Megan, and Andrea. So if you do have any follow-up questions or if maybe something just pops into your mind an hour from now, a day from now, a week from now, uh, we can make sure that those questions uh, get to the right person and you get some answers. And of course, as Megan pointed out, uh, I'm sure Megan, Ryan, Andrea, um, and Scott, uh, certainly more than happy to field questions down the road or just explore opportunities for collaboration and partnership and engagement in the future. Uh, so again, uh, on behalf of the chapter and the section, my heartfelt thanks to Scott, Ryan, Megan, Andrea for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, and thank you uh, to everyone who took the time to attend and participate as well. Um, have a wonderful rest of your week uh, and more information about upcoming events soon to follow. Thank you very much.